let us do more problems on combination of simple harmonic motions based upon principle of linear superposition so the first problem that we address is is principle of linear superposition valid in the following cases number 1 gravitation number 2 electric field number 3 electrostatic energy density let us denote this by gravitational field gravitational field e electric field e electrostatic energy density u 4 magnetic field or magnetic induction denoted by vector b magnetic energy density denoted by u say and number 6 the last one is nuclear field or force so let us go to the answer source mass is say m1 and m2 for m1 the gravitational field is say vector e1 and for source mass m2 the gravitational field is vector e2 gravitational field at a point now when both the masses are present then what will the field be the field will be vector e which is a linear superposition of the individual fields due to the individual masses so principle of linear superposition holds in this case number 2 consider source charge say q1 q2 the electric field due to them is vector e1 and vector e2 at point p say at some point p and when both the charges are placed together the resultant electric field will be a linear superposition of the electrostatic fields produced by these charges when they are individually placed when they are separately placed so the principle of linear superposition is valid in case of electric field let us now consider here the electrostatic energy density which for charge q1 is u1 the value of which is half epsilon 0 e1 square and that for q2 is half epsilon 0 e2 square now when q1 plus q2 is present the electrostatic energy density will be u 
which is half epsilon 0 the field square which is not equal to obviously half epsilon 0 e1 square plus half epsilon 0 e2 square so this means principle of linear superposition is not valid in case of electrostatic energy density so 2 and 3 have been answered now we address magnetic induction and magnetic energy density so answer to 4 let us consider source current say i1 or i2 and the corresponding magnetic induction at a point is vector b1 and vector b2 respectively so when both the currents together flow then it is i which is i1 plus i2 then the field will be a linear superposition of the fields produced by the individual currents so principle of linear superposition holds for magnetic field now for magnetic energy density for i1 the magnetic energy density is say u1 which is b1 square by twice mu0 and for u2 it is b2 square by twice mu0 when current i flows it is b square by twice mu0 and b is vector b1 plus vector b2 square by twice mu0 which obviously is not equal to that is u1 plus u2 so principle of linear superposition is not valid for magnetic energy density so this is 4 and 5 let us now address the last one nuclear force or field is very complicated it consists of nonlinear terms and so principle of linear superposition does not hold this means that we cannot simply add two nuclear fields or forces to get a resultant nuclear field or force we now come to the next problem which says that a particle executes simple harmonic motion with a time period t1 
under one constraining force and with time period T2 under another means another constraining force. Now show that the time period when both constraining forces act together is given by let us come to the answer of this problem we consider a particle or oscillator its mass is say m displacement that the oscillator suffers under the action of the two constraining forces is say x now the constraining forces are say f1 and f2 so under the first constraining force f1 the corresponding spring constant being k1 so we have f1 equal to minus k1 x because the spring constant is actually mod of f1 by x and the time period as given is t1 so time period is t1 which is under the second constraining force call it f2 the spring constant being k2 we have f2 equal to minus k2 x and the corresponding time period is given to be t2 which is now when both the forces act together so under both forces f1 plus f2 and the spring constant then is k we then have f is minus k x and the time period is We now have to interrelate the three time periods, two of which correspond to separate application of forces F1 and F2 and this T corresponds to the collective application of the two forces. So instead of F, let us write F1 plus F2 which is equal to minus Kx and instead of F1 we can write minus k1x and instead of f2 minus k2x so on simplification we end up with so this time period then is
So this is the time period when two forces are applied together. It is divide by m to get. Now from this relation we get two pi by t one whole square is k1 by m and similarly from this relation two pi by t2 whole square is k2 by m therefore from here we end up with instead of k1 by m And instead of K2 by M, so 4 pi square will cancel out 2 pi and therefore we are left with So it is we can take this outside to end up with which we were required to prove. We now come to a very important problem show that the amplitude a n of the displacement resulting from the linear addition of n simple harmonic vibrations all of same amplitude amplitude being a and frequency being omega but having different initial phase angles initial phase angles means epochs to be phi 1 equal to epsilon phi 2 as twice epsilon phi 3 is given to be 3 epsilon and it goes on like that and phi n is a n epsilon is given by the equation that is the expression of the resultant amplitude a n is given by this is what we have to prove it is also asked in what phenomenon in physics this result is obtained so let us address this let us spell out what is given 
n simple harmonic motions have been thought of so n shms are there they all have same frequency and the frequency is say omega they have same amplitude and they have different epochs that is epsilon twice epsilon thrice epsilon and finally n epsilon let us write down the equations of the shms one is x1 one is x2 one is x3 and finally we have xn and the structure of each is of the type let us do with cos for convenience let us switch over to complex representation according to which x1 can be written as real part of a e to the power i omega t plus epsilon because if we extract the real part we get cos and similarly x2 will be real part of a e to the power i omega t plus twice epsilon x3 will be and similarly the last one xn will be real part of a e to the power i omega t plus n epsilon as in previous problems the result and displacement of course using principle of linear superposition is given by x equal to x1 plus x2 plus x3 and the last term is xn from each we can take a to the power i omega t common so real part of a to the power i omega t let us take common and then we are left with e to the power i epsilon from the second term we have e to the power i into twice epsilon then e to the power i thrice epsilon and the last one has e to the power i n epsilon So let us take e to the power i epsilon common, so that we are left with one plus e to the power i epsilon e to the power twice epsilon. And the last term is e to the power i n minus one epsilon. We note that this is the first term. and this is e to the power i to 0 first term but e to the power i into 0 and 0 is 1 minus 1 the second term and this is e to the power i into epsilon 
and this can be written as e to the power i 2 minus 1 epsilon 2 for the second term and here e to the power i 1 minus 1 epsilon 1 for the first term for the third term e to the power i 2 epsilon 2 can be written as 3 minus 1 epsilon so for the last term it is e to the power i n minus 1 epsilon this is actually the nth term so things are clear now and we note that this is a gp series having first term unity and the common ratio is e to the power i epsilon so that the sum will be so what we get is x equal to real part of a to the power i omega t e to the power i epsilon multiplied by this factor we focus attention to this factor let us take common e to the power i n epsilon by 2 from the numerator and from the denominator we take e to the power i epsilon by 2 common now use the result this is sine of x so we have n minus 1 2 i getting cancelled out in the numerator and in the denominator so collecting the terms we have from here from here it is time to simplify things so let us take i common we have omega t epsilon and then n minus 1 epsilon by 2 now this is n epsilon by 2 plus epsilon minus epsilon by 2 is epsilon by 2 So what we have is, this is e to the power and here we have now real part of e to the power this factor involving i is cosine. So we can write x equal to a and let us write this factor here cosine of this factor let us call it a n as given in the question so we have a n
and let us call epsilon by 2 as beta so this becomes so we have proved what was given in the question and now let us address this part let us mention the phenomena in physics where this result is used this result or this type of result is used in the analysis of diffraction pattern by a plane optical diffraction grating means an end slit device where the amplitude on screen is of the form amplitude means square root of intensity of light this is where this factor is used where a being the width of the slit and beta represents where B stands for the width of opaque space theta is the diffraction angle or the angle of diffraction and lambda is the wavelength of light and grating looks like This is the slit through which light enters and then we have an opaque space and then again another slit through which light enters and then an opaque space then again a slit through which light enters and the structure goes on like that. So this is A, this length, the width of the slit and the width of the opaque space is B. So this is the structure of a grating which has n number of slits.